We are moving to the third and final contributor talk of today. Right now, we have we will have the pleasure of listening to Ryan Miller from University of Geneva, whose talk is titled "Chemical Reduction and Quantum Interpretation." Ryan, uh, one more time, you have twenty minutes for your presentation. When you have spoken for 10 minutes, I will interrupt you to let you know that you have 10 minutes more. So the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Okay, so the um, plan of the talk is kind of as follows. First of all, super quick review of uh, Robin's emergent dispositions. I think most people know it really well. Then a slightly more extended review of Franklin and Seifert's um, recent quantum reduction response to Hendry's view. Um, then uh, an argument that there's a common assumption of both Henry's view and theirs that is, uh, I think, not uh, can't be upheld, which in fact opens the door for an even stronger emergentism. So that's the that's the overall plan. All right. So first, Henry's emergentism. Now this is going to be an, a really simplified version. I think most of you know it, but basically, here you have an example of you have a chiral molecule, which is a left-handed and a right-handed kind, and uh, the wave function, if you go to compute it ab initio, is symmetrical. So somehow you need to break the symmetry because, you know, in reality we only see you know the left hand and the right hand version, right? We don't we don't ever actually encounter some kind of mixed version. Um, and so Henry argues from you know cases similar to this that look, there's got to be some kind of downward causation, some kind of uh, emergent reality in chemistry because. At, at the chemical level, we only have the left-handed and the right-handed kind, whereas at the physical level, uh, what we have is um, a mixed state uh, that you know, doesn't have any way of breaking that symmetry. And so we, we should think of chemistry as some kind of emergent reality. All right, so what does Franklin and Seifert's 2020 paper say in response to this? Um, first, they say that determinate structure, meaning chemical structure, basically is just the measurement problem, you know, the third, the, the measurement problem in, in quantum mechanics says somehow we need to get one determinate reality um, out of our Schrodinger's equation, even though um, that just gives us uh, something that's not determinate of one outcome. And so that's the measurement problem. And Franklin and Seifert argue that that's the same thing that, that Henry and similar emergentists are running into. Then they argue that there are three serviceable solutions to the measurement problem. Uh, in quantum mechanics. And so if structure is just a measurement problem, and there's a physical answer to the measurement problem, then structure is reducible. So rather than thinking of structure as emergent on the basis of Hendry type arguments, uh, we should uh, pass that by. So what does that look like? Uh, well, the three um, answers to the measurement problem, of course, are just the, you know, Maudlin's trilemma from 1995. Everettianism, uh, which denies that there actually is a determinate answer. Determinate answer is only the world relative determinate answer. So determination is really locating ourselves in the space of worlds. Um, so for, and then uh, the Bohmian answer, which is of course that um, the uh, quantum state is not complete. We also have a guidance equation and uh, the GRW answer that um, the Schrodinger equation, you know, isn't the only thing that happens, it has to collapse at various intervals. So first of all, the Everettian case. So in the Everettian case, right, the idea is um, while perhaps um, for an individual molecule, especially a small molecule like this one, um, maybe there wouldn't be any kind of uh, collapse because there's no kind of decoherence process that's necessarily gonna grab hold of this, uh, that especially if we look to a large collection of molecules or maybe a very large molecule, um, eventually you're going to get de decoherence. When you get decoherence, then you get some kind of world fission process uh, that's going to go on. And so you end up in two different worlds. You have two different worlds. One, one world has the left-handed version. One world has the right-handed version. And when you go ahead and check on the structure with um, you know, X-ray spectroscopy or something else, you're going to see um, which version you know, you're in, which world you're in. And so here uh, they say, look, um, we have a structure um, that Everettianism gives us a way of, of showing how we're going to end up with one determinate structure, um, even though, uh, you know, ab initio, it looks like both structures are, um, are going to be part of the, the Schrodinger equation. 
but it's decoherent is doing the work. All right, now what about the Bohmian case? Now here we end up telling a similar story. So basically um, in the Bohmian case, um, what we have is you know particle trajectories that are varying uh, widely, right? So at, at any given time, um, it looks like in the Bohmian case without decoherence, you might not have uh, either of these um, neatly mapped, right? You might have particle trajectories that are in some other configuration or something in between. Um, because the guidance equation um, kind of lets them do that. But uh, that when you have decoherence, what's going to happen is that they're going to kind of quickly uh, kind of snap to one or the other of these, these outcomes, right? That the particles, the guidance equation is going to bring the particles in a very short amount of time to one outcome or the other um, and during uh, decoherence. So again, it's a decoherence-based story, but rather than being a story about uh, many worlds and locating which world we're in. It's just a story of locating the particles, um, which the guidance equation does after a brief time in decoherence. What about GRW? Um, well, now it's going to look pretty similar, um, except now um, rather than having uh, deciding which world we're in or deciding where the particles are according to the guidance equation, um, now we're just going to look at a wait for a collapse event. So basically GRW, right, is an objective collapse theory. So we start out in a superposition of the two chiral molecules, but then uh, there's a collapse event that occurs and uh, the wave function sharply peaks around either the left hand or the right hand molecule. Um, and so then you get a determinate configuration. And this could happen uh, in the case of even a, an isolated molecule uh, but collapse events are pretty rare um, for small numbers of molecules, so that wouldn't happen too often. Whereas if you have a large ensemble of molecules or a very large organic molecule of some kind, then collapse events will be more common. And so you'll, you're you more likely to get a determined outcome. But in either case, it's just a result of collapse. All right. So that was a very quick review of an article that I hope a lot of you maybe have read. I think it's a really interesting and important article. But the basic structure is, is this, the basic idea is the same in all three cases, right? It's that we have um, the stuff there. And uh, when we apply the logic of whichever one of the three quantum interpretations we're looking at, we see why we end up with a determinate structure. Because the logic of the quantum interpretation itself leads us to that determinate structure, we don't need to posit any emergence. Um, so that's, that's Franklin and Seifert's argument. All right, so I suggest that this actually, um, they, despite the fact that they're arguing um, for reductionist option, or at least the possibility of a reductionist option against Hendry's emergentism, I think that they share a very important principle with Hendry, and that's Hendry's actually present elements principle. So uh, this principle, you know, is be begins as kind of an argument against Aristotle, right? So the idea is that, say, in carbon dioxide, the carbon and the oxygen are not just potentially present as Aristotle says about mixing elements, but that rather they're somehow actually present. But I take it that in Henry's emergence arguments, he actually takes this to be a little bit stronger and to apply also to kind of physical uh, level realities, right? That uh, what's actually present um, in some molecule is not just uh, the elements, but rather also um, the nuclei and the components of the nuclei. So there's actually a certain number of protons there, a certain number of neutrons there, and that's what gives uh, those elements their atomic numbers, atomic weights, et cetera. And that's a principle that um, Franklin and Seifert don't criticize, right? So all of their uh, responses are really at the level of structure. So in each of the cases they take for granted, yes, there's a proton, some protons, some neutrons, some electrons here. Um, and what they're trying to show is that given the existence of those actually present elements, that the quantum interpretations give rise to the structure that Hendry is looking for of you know, finding this, or the left-handed, say, or the right-handed molecule. But I'm not so sure that the realist uh, quantum ontologies surveyed by Franklin and Seifert, uh, which are, you know, the three that are, are the major ones to look at, um, and in a way, arguably the only ones given kind of Maudlin's trilemma, if we want to think of Bohmianism as kind of the leading example of a modal theory. Um, I don't think these necessarily bear out uh, the actually present elements principle. 
So why would I say that? Well, um, uh, these um, on the, each of these three uh, interpretations, the dynamical interpretations, comes with a possible set of ontologies, and um, so the, you can look at either the high dimensional ontologies, which I won't spend a lot of time on because I think that these are pretty unfriendly um, to the actually present elements principle. Because the actually present elements principle, right? The idea is that there's actually present physical stuff in 3D space to then have the structure. But the high dimensional ontologies deny that there's anything uh, fundamentally present in 3D space, that that's all going to be derivative um, or emergent from something that's um, in a high dimensional space. So we can talk about that in Q&A if you want, but I think that's um, uh, Excuse pretty me, obvious. Ryan, yes. 10 minutes more. Yes, um, pretty obviously um, unfriendly uh, to the actually present elements principle. So then that leaves the primitive ontologies. And for that, we have, um, for many worlds, we have um, uh, Timpson and Wallace's um, space state realism, SM. We have uh, the kind of distributed particle familiar ontology from Bohmianism. And then for GRW, we have the mass density ontology and the flash ontology. Now, the only one of these I'm not really gonna talk about um, later is the mass, mass density ontology for GRW. So let me just kind of, try to suggest why I don't think that's a good contender. So first of all, under the mass density ontology, well, there aren't any um, electrons or protons or neutrons, right? There's just a continuous flow of mass density. Um, so I think that's already going to be uh, a big problem for the actually present elements principle. And furthermore, um, GRWM is subject to the kind of the tails problem, right? Where after you've got a collapse, you still get tails with kind of the same configuration and the other side, so I'm not even sure that it really does necessarily answer uh, this the kind of structural um, collapse question. So leaving that aside, I'm, I'll walk through uh, the other three following the same order that um, Seifert and, and Franklin do. All right, so leaving aside those high dimensional ontologies, leaving aside um, GRW. All right, so first of all, um, many worlds, the space-time state realism. So basically the picture here is just a gradient uh, chart um, from X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so basically, um, space-time state realism on Wallace and Timpson's picture of Everettianism is, is basically that what you get in decoherence is a certain kind of state of the space-time. So it's not a separable ontology. It's not an ontology that lends itself to myriology as they freely in that, uh, analyze. There are no strict concepts of parthood in this ontology. So to the extent that there's going to be low level actually present elements at all, um, they're going to be present as kind of patterns in space time, in, in the stuff of space time itself. And that's the kind of thing that was revealed maybe when we do something like X-ray spectroscopy is we get a kind of a pattern um, that's that we've interacted with. But look at the, over, so, the, you know, you see here the overlay um, of the, the chemical structure of this molecule on the pattern, but look what, what doesn't really show up. So first of all, Notice how the hydrogen molecules aren't really um, showing up in the space in the, the pattern at all, right? They're just kind of we know that they should be there. We know that they're there for the chemistry, so we pen them in. But um, at this resolution, we don't get them, right? We'd have to kind of up the resolution to see those. And similarly, notice how the other molecules, while they do kind of show up as molecules, as centers, as gradients. Uh, we don't actually have any nuclei showing up, right, on this um, X-ray spectroscopy chart. Why? Well, because we're not going at the energies that we need to to resolve the nuclei. So what does this mean? Well, it means that right now when we're, we're producing this chart, we're actually only working at, at a level of decoherence, a degree of decoherence um, that reveals the overall shape of the molecule, which it does quite well, which is why we use X-ray spectroscopy. It's not a level of decoherence that actually reveals the position of the nuclei, let alone the components of the nuclei. Um, that would require even more decoherence to happen, higher energies to be involved. So rather than having first the stuff at the low level and then building up some structure, we actually go the other way around. We have first the structure at the high level, and only when more decoherence happens do we get low level structure. So this isn't, this is the complete opposite of the approach that that Hendry and, and uh, Seifert and, and Franklin all kind of assume. What about the pilot wave case? Well, here, pay close attention to the scale on the left. 
So the scale on the left, notice, is in millimeters. So this is a, a track of Bohmian particles through time. And these are the little kind of what are the common called the surreal trajectories from the guidance equation, these little um, quirks, these little shifts in the Bohmian trajectories. And notice how big they are, right? They're on the scale of millimeters, right? So they're, you know, maybe a quarter of a millimeter or something like that um, on this chart. Well, in molecular terms, that's enormous, right? So that's many, many, you know, molecules away. So to think of this Bohmian particle as a part of a molecule that just has to get into the right structure is really, really misleading because that particle isn't even in the neighborhood, perhaps, of the molecule until we look at it, until decoherence occurs. And so it's just um, to think of these things as actually present in some molecular neighborhood, just waiting for structure to occur is just the wrong framing. Um, and then what about um, objective collapse theories? Well, here again, let's think about the scales very closely. So given what we currently know about the kind of constraints on objective collapse theories, um, this time scale is actually enormously large. If, if this is supposed to be a single particle family um, going up um, you know, each of these lines, right? so maybe this is supposed to be like a four particle chart, then the T axis has to be you know, thousands of years to get those particles to flash this often. Most of the time, there's just nothing there in space time. And so um, to think that there's something actually present um, it's just not, not the case. Most of the time, there's just nothing present there for any given, any given atom. And it's only, um, you know, yes, it would have to be present in a certain place if um, it was entangled with a certain larger system and the, that certain larger system, flash, et cetera. But most of the time, there's just nothing present there um, at all. So again, nothing present at the low level to have a structure. So what's the conclusion I want to draw here? Basically, it's just that, you know, we should be realists. So first of all, we should be realists about chemistry, right? Chemistry is an enormously successful science and we shouldn't derogate it. So if we have a certain molarity of stuff, Avogadro's number tells you how many molecules, atoms, et cetera, there are, right? That's just the chemical reality. It's really successful. We shouldn't deny that. Um, there really are that many molecules and atoms present. That, that we think of from, from calculating our molarity. But we should also be realists about physics. And all three realist interpretations of quantum mechanics deny that there's so much physical stuff around. So I take this to have actually a relatively straightforward conclusion, which is that chemistry is ontologically irreducible to physics precisely because its physical constituents are only possibly present, um, just as you know Aristotle said originally. So I take this as to be a kind of argument against the actually present elements principle that Hendry and um, uh, and, and Seifert and, and Franklin share in favor of an even stronger version of emergence than the Hendry's. Because Hendry's just saying this kind of downward causation, but it's actually present at the lower level. And I'm saying, no, I think Aristotle was right in the first place. The lower level is only potentially present to begin with. Thank you, Ryan. So we can start the round of questions and answers. We have a few minutes. Please be concise and brief. Anybody has a question? Thank you, Jesus, please. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. I think that I, I, I found it very interesting. Uh, my right. question has to do with the idea of dumbbell causation. Maybe I, I I didn't get very well your your point, but because when you say that the parts of the whole are potential or, or uh, they exist potentially and depends on the whole, uh, that uh, that is a kind of uh, top down causation, no? Maybe. So I can't use yeah. the last word used. A kind of what? A kind of top-down oh. determination. Well, it, yeah. So I guess um, it's top-down determination in probably the sense that you were saying, and there's a kind of a formal causality there, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's top-down causation in Hendry's sense because it seems to me that what Robin is arguing for is a kind of efficient causation between the upper level and the lower level in the way that mm -hmm. top-down causation is often used in the emergence literature. So it's 
it just depends on whether what you want to mean by top-down causation. If you mean formal causality, a kind of vertical notion or grounding, yeah, absolutely. If you mean efficient causation from one level to another, then no. Claro. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, I guess Dimitri Weiss uh, have a question. So you have a question? Okay. Um, you are muting. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for your report. In uh, a little remark, in a picture, objective collapse, R G R W F, I see um, spiral patterns. And it's very interesting to see this graphic in polar system coordinate, uh, like a phylotaxis pattern. Uh, you understand, no? I yeah, propose, I, mean, I propose uh, draw this image in polar system coordinate, non uh, Descartes system co coordinate, but polar system coordinate, because I see hmm, uh, the spiral pattern in this graphic, object collapse picture uh, in your yeah. picture. Yeah, so sometimes similar diagrams are drawn in polar coordinates um, to, you know, and you show a spiraling, which could happen, of course, in a magnetic field or something else that would cause a spiraling like that. I mean, that's fine. Uh, but the, the basic point remains that the collapse rate, in, according to GRW's kind of empirical plausibility, the collapse rate is really, really low. And because the collapse rate is really, really low, such that any given particle, it's really funny to call it particle because really some of the wave function for a particle, right? Like, but the wave function for a particle is only gonna collapse, you know, every few thousand years, right? Like it's really, really rare um, for a single particle. And so for a small molecule, you know, that's not that much higher than that, right? Um, so, you know, whether you draw it on a, on a spiral, just to, in terms of this particular diagram, whether you want to illustrate that there's some particles moving, you know, in a, in a field that's causing them to, to, to spin in terms of where their wave function is headed, you know, that's fine. But the basic point I was just making was just about that extent of that vertical axis um, and just how big it is, which makes the stuff in space time look, you know, more like a potential than, a, than an actual, or at least most of the time it's potential. Um, of course, sometimes potentials are actualized. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone has another question? Uh, Michelle, please. It, it's just a small question. Is, is the idea of a, a function actually collapsing sounds a bit odd to me as well. Because a, a function I think of as a mathematical you know, it's just a formula. So, or it's just, uh, uh, you know, some mathematical movement. So for it to collapse, well, what does it mean? <laughs> Maybe it's a quick question. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, so, I mean, there's some dispute about this and it also depends on how you want to consider the wave function, right? There's a whole bunch of different views out there about what the wave function is. Sometimes people say, Function is not even a good word because, I mean, it's the word we're stuck with because of history, but maybe this is kind of like a real physical entity that can kind of like change shape and stuff like that. So if that's the case, then whatever. But just at the mathematical level, collapse is just a kind of a shorthand for multiplying the wave function by a, a narrow Gaussian. Um, so because you're multiplying it by a Gaussian, um, then, you know, the, the function you know, gets a lot narrower after you compose it, right? Um, and so that's what's meant by collapse. And then for the flashy version of GRW, the kind of ontological interpretation of that mathematical fact is that you get an event in space-time at the center of that Gaussian. So when you multiply the wave function times the Gaussian, then the center of where that point is in space-time, you get an event, a point like you know, a, a, a space-time point um, is somehow activated, made special, made something more than a space-time point. Um, did, did, and so, would, would, yeah. would the words Would the word singularity be used there? I mean, they don't tend to. Like, that's not the, the word that Tomoka uses, but I mean, whether you want to call it that. I mean, normally it's just called an event or a flash. Um, 
uh, you know, I mean, we're always kind of groping for words for these things, right? Because they're not, they're not, uh, if they're not things from our common sense, you know, experience, but, um, but yeah, so whether you want to call it a flash, an event, and a singularity, I don't think it much matters, but the idea that it's just some, something that makes those space-time points special, something has happened there in a way that's not true of, of other space-time points. Um, so that's all that's meant. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.